Um, I'd like to preface this panel by just briefly stating that UO is committed to student research, and one of the ways that we do so is to try to offer opportunities as much as we can. We are incredibly fortunate to have so many brilliant graduate students at this institution who are all working on comics or related fields of research, and our graduate students, those on the panel and two others, contributed essays to the catalog for this exhibition, The Art of the News. So please do check out their print work when the catalog comes out because it's really beautiful and it's been beautifully formatted. So I'm going to start by introducing you to your moderator. Nick Wirtz is a third year comparative literature PhD student. His research explores comics aesthetics informed by media studies, art history, and his own incredibly well-developed creative and artistic practices. He focuses on nonfiction comics as world lit. Please welcome Nick Wirtz. Uh, thank you. So, um, I have the uh, pleasure today of introducing five of my fellow graduate students, um, Alex, Ash, uh, Chris, Ryan, uh, Deb, and Ryan, and they'll be presenting today on, um, a, as Dr. Kelp Stebbins uh, stated, on um, on essays that were originally developed for this catalog, among other writing and artist interviews to accompany the artwork. And on that note, I'd like to um, Thank Professor Kelp Stebbins on behalf of the panel for her persistent commitment to a visible graduate student presence throughout the exhibition. Um, Alex Newsom will be uh, will begin this panel with Sarah Merck and T. Breeze in Vulnerable, and Alex is a fifth year uh, PhD candidate in the English department. She works in the fields of modernism and comic studies, both as separate fields and at their intersections which often finds her in the wilds of comparative media analysis. Alex's self-described uh, self formalist, and it is through this method that she will be approaching her contribution to this panel. Sean, Sarah, Zenobia, etc. 
would seem to suggest a kind of impartiality, as if each of the individual accounts could be weighed equally in terms of what they reveal about the pandemic and its consequences. However, this apparent formal impartiality is undone when we consider the ways the stories place different themes and experiences in juxtaposition. As it turns out, some subjects struggle far more than others, and not all their experiences carry the same weight. This is made apparent by the first juxtaposition of the collection, which contrasts Manuel's experience with that of a high-level investment broker named Sean, who discusses the precarity of the stock market. Manuel tells us that if the virus makes it here, um, a detention center in Pine Prairie, Louisiana, this place is a ticking time bomb, a fragment of dialogue that also serves as a subtitle for Manuel's story on the contents page. By contrast, the subtitle of Sean's interview, also a fragment of dialogue, tells us that scary times can be exciting as well. <laughs> the message is clear. The precarity that Manuel and Sean both face is not equal. The interviews gathered and represented as comics journalism in Invulnerable are clearly meant to be read in dialogue with one another then. And Manuel's story, by dint of priority, serves to teach the audience how to hear this dialogue and in some sense, how to read all the stories that follow. Louis' choice to position Manuel in such a way that he is constantly looking out. Oh, there was the juxtaposition. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Louis' choice to position Manuel in such a way that he is constantly looking out at the reader is also suggestive of the overall importance of this story for the collection. Elsewhere, Boy usually includes at least one panel in which the individual telling their story looks directly at the reader, but these are interspersed with panels showing them going about their business, or more thematic panels that don't depict the speakers at all, but instead illustrate some larger point of their narrative. By contrast, Manuel is not only present in every panel of his story, but in more than half of them, he appears to violate the convention of the fourth wall by talking directly to us as we follow him throughout his day-to-day -day activities in the ICE Processing Center. In fact, Manuel's face is fully obscured in only one of the eight panels of the story, the second panel on the first page, which shows him being savagely beaten. Here, Manuel would be unidentifiable without the caption box. Based on the image alone, the man being beaten could be almost anyone. Bowie's choice to hide Manuel's face during this particularly vulnerable moment not only emphasizes his visibility, indeed the centrality of his face in the rest of the panels, but also draws attention to the work of the reader's gaze itself. The other panels imply a reciprocal gaze between the individual telling their story and the witness of that story. There was this reciprocal act of seeing and being seen is rendered perhaps most explicitly in the second to last panel of the narrative, in which we see Manuel looking out from his interviewer's tablet and being looked upon and listened to by his interviewer. This foregrounding of the experience of being seen and recognized, contrasted with the loss of individuality at the moment of highest, in, uh, highest vulnerability, works to emphasize the power differential at play between looking and being looked at as well as the crucial difference between being objectified by someone's gaze and recognizes the subject in the sight of another. Manuel's story also serves as a reminder that to look is a privilege and to witness is to be made aware of someone else's vulnerability. Manuel's answering gaze, particularly as rendered by Bui in the final two panels, reminds the reader that there is a politics and a privilege implicit in any act of looking. In the prior six panels, the reader is positioned alongside Manuel by an omniscient comics narrator, sharing his cell, accompanying him on chores, but with the seventh panel, this illusion is suddenly dispelled as the camera eye pulls back still further and we see Manuel telling his story to his interviewer by means of a digital device. We were never in prison with him. Instead, the interviewer, and by implication, the audience, is safe at home on the other side of the screen. This abrupt switch of perspectives, taking us from inside the detention facility to behind the shoulder of an interviewer with an iPad, 
represents one of the most vertiginous moments in the entire collection. Indeed, we will not see a direct representation of an interviewer or witness again. It's a choice that underlines the reality of Manuel's isolation. No matter how much we might relate or sympathize with his situation, he alone must bear the burden of his experience. It's also a moment that sends a fundamental message of the best comics journalism, that the act of witnessing carries with it an enormous responsibility. But even as the penultimate panel reminds us of our distance from his struggles, Manuel's positioning in the last panel perhaps attempts, perhaps attempts to transcend the barriers of distance and time. Though the vertical frame Manuel, le Manuel leans on still represents the post of his bunk bed, as shown in the first panel, it takes on a visual alignment with the panel border, almost suggesting that he could push aside the basic confines of the page and move toward us. The emphasis on his distance, followed immediately by a close-up that works to erase that distance, suggests the unique possibilities of the comics medium for nonfiction narrative. The comics form can both create illusions of closeness to activate empathy, while at the same time reminding us of the power of our own gaze and the potential vulnerability of those who are objects of our scrutiny. Just as the structural decision to open and vulnerable with Manuel's story teaches us to read these stories in dialogue with one another, his framing throughout his story demonstrates the interplay between vulnerability and agency that is fundamental to the collection as a whole. Thank you, Alex. Um, Next, uh, Ash uh, Connell Gonzalez um, received their MA at the University of, of Texas San Antonio. They are a fourth year PhD student in English and an anarcho transhumanist studying comics and other things not so related to this panel, including gender, sexuality, robots, and other unhuman beings. They will be discussing the visual metaphors and compositions inside the panel of Yazan al Sadi and Tracy Chawan's My Heart Burns. My Heart Burns details the horrors that Syrian refugees face when they are preyed upon by scammers. Throughout the first several pages of this comic, the characters, features, and the settings in which they are placed are represented with distinctive individualizing detail. The sixth panel sequence that closes My Heart Burns, therefore, comes as a stunning contrast in its stylization. Through a combination of myth on scene, the specific placement and perspectives taken on the context, contents of the panel, color symbolism in the printed version from the nib, um, an imagery drawn from the history of propaganda, as well as a shift in written narrative from past to present with a bleak prediction of the future. This final page serves as a powerful call to action. The text in the first panel insists that current efforts to inform refugees about the dangers of scams and fraud do not, quote, help those who have already fallen into a trap, and that such awareness campaigns do not tackle the true heart of the matter. This text is accompanied by a stark high contrast rendering of a refugee seated behind a table. The displaced status of this figure is emphasized by her posture um, and by the rendering. She's swathed in heavy shadows. Um, despite the presence of an obvious light source. While the light refuses to shine on the refugee, the room itself tilts, tilts, down, to the, in, uh, tilts down to the right in the direction of the door, as if to say, move along, there's no help to be had here, and also towards the danger of the whirlpool on the following panel. The visual metaphor is clear. Stateless peoples cannot, can not only expect no recompense if they are taken in by scams, but this lack of legal and institutional support will tip them into dangerous situations. In the following panel, the danger bleeds red as the Kraken emerges from a whirlpool while the storm rolls in and the sea froths. In previous panels, red symbolized the burning anger against the injustices done um, to Ahmed and her family. Here, the red that fills the sky and the water evokes the horrors of the lives lost by those um, taking the dangerous Mediterranean passage to refuge. As the old proverb goes, red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. Even for those who might survive the crossing to Europe, other dangers can still sink hopes, and those too are invoked by the image of the Kraken. Its many arms suggest the numerous barriers and impediments the refugees face. 
from the scammers who steal everything from them to the entangling tentacular loops of the red tape that denies them access to the basic rights of citizenship. Further symbolized here by the paperwork that the Kraken offers and baffling and uselessly. The Krakens also served historically in wartime propaganda to portray a variety of nations, including Germany, England, and Russia, as a metaphor in, and as a metaphor in socialist writing for specific aspects or embodiments of capitalism, including landlordism, banking power, legal corruption, and globalization. Um, Alcide and Chawan are therefore drawing upon the more extensive entries in the political economic bestiary to figure the human monstrosity of institutional indifference that causes so much suffering and death. They also make, um, the comic also makes further allusions to propaganda in the third panel. Um, yeah, in the third panel. Here the text captions speak of the harm that deluded notions of purity and supremacy are causing humanity overall. As vocabulary calls to mind, um, Nazism and white supremacy, so does the black on red image of the sun burst encircling the globe visually invokes these same poisonous ideologies. The black on red color scheme and sunburst imagery being familiar from numer numerous nationalistic wartime propaganda posters. This panel underlines the point iconographically by encircling the entire globe with barbed wire. This is a nationalism that constricts the entire planet with dire consequences. By repurposing early 20th century calls to war in this way, the threat of nationalism is displayed in its own visual language. The following panel depicts faceless, verdant silhouettes trudging through a room. The red color of these silhouettes in the Nibs version now invokes the violence experienced by all displaced people who are searching for a safe place to live as normally as possible across time and throughout the world. The universal nature of their suffering is emphasized by the lack of distinguishing details. They are just shapes picked out against the solid background while the blank, featureless um, room through which they march suggests the indifferent institutions that provide no real shelter. These anon on anonymous figures now stand for all the refugees that have ever been. Um, after that, we get this sort of very visual um, image that invokes a lot of the climate change disaster that will come across about capitalism. And then the final panel, right, we get, once again, these sort of faceless, masked figures with no actual body behind it, sort of looking back and not allowing us to move forward, um, representing sort of the struggle to get on beyond these um, structures that are in place. Um, as we say, mutual aid, the government will not help us, so we must help each other. Uh, thank you, Ash. Um, Chris Ivey is a third-year PhD student, and his research focuses on 20th century um, uh, American visual and sonic cultures. He uh, has specific interests in comic, film, and radio, and engages shifting cultural and political frameworks which inform his reading of Andy Warner's Visualizing Early COVID Statistics. Thank you. So forgive the cringy pun. I'm really sorry. It's just kind of how I roll, so I'm sorry again. Andy Warner's art rewards those who look closely. Perhaps known best for his astounding work on human rights and environmental issues, Warner has also become a strong source of information and insight during the coronavirus pandemic. His pandemic stats fold out, which you can see here, was first published digitally in the Nib Magazine's November 2020 issue, Pandemic, and it provides reader viewers with vital statistics regarding the COVID-19 crisis and displays in full view the structural inequalities that the pandemic exposed and exacerbated. Through the use of graphs, visual symbolism and metaphor, and the complex visual verbal form of the digital foldout, Warner's pandemic stats highlights the connections between structures of inequality, incompetent leadership, and COVID-19's continued impact on American life. And so the first thing reader viewers may notice here is that the foldout is split into two numerical calendar graphs by a black line that runs through the center of the image. 
The portion of the page above, above the black center line features the graph tracking new daily reported cases of COVID-19 in the United States with red and white lines. The graph in the bottom half of the image tallies daily reported deaths from COVID-19 in the United States with black and white lines. Warner further emphasizes the counting metrics of his two larger graphs through visual symbolism. The daily reported cases of COVID-19 in the United States are surrounded by, and almost attached to, symbolic representations of viral pathogens, uh, pathogens sorry, with the daily reported deaths are enclosed by two skulls and crossbeds. And if they're not visible from afar, I'm gonna zoom in on them a bit so it becomes more clear where they are. Importantly, Warner's graphs show that as a symbolic COVID pathogen spreads and becomes nearly invisible, it remains destructive and deadly as it moves across the United States. COVID's deadliness is possibly best illustrated by the presentation of bodies, which fall continuously from the sky as black and white figures, even after the skulls and crossbones fade from view. The spectator may not be able to see the virus, but they can register its spread and impact through the numbers and visual symbolism Warner provides. By connecting numbers and percentages to connotations of the dying body, Warner reinforces deftly the idea that these are not just data points, they are people who have lost their lives. Warner's clever use of page layout and the visual verbal form of the digital foldout creates room for reader viewers to consider critically the structures of inequality and ineptitude that allowed the pandemic to spread through the United States unabated. Instead of presenting COVID-19 cases and deaths as distinct events occurring outside the realm of political and social struggle, Warner highlights the connections between structures of inequality and COVID-19's surge. I'll kind of slow down through some of these. So, on the left, you can hopefully see more clearly the viral pathogens that are symbolized at the top and the skull and crossbones at the bottom. Something I didn't note in my write-up is in the kind of high wave that is rocking New York in April, the words people and each day are capitalized and they really stand out kind of in that image, which further emphasizes that idea that, again, these are, these are people. And I think sometimes reading the news or following it, there was a sense I had certainly that it was forgotten they were people and it just became data. And I think this really emphasizes that they are people, definitely emphasized here, which I think is important. And I'll bump through a couple more of these. This is kind of the end of the graph where the viral pathogens reappear in the month of September. Otherwise they fade from the beginning and you don't really see them again until the very end of the graph. But again, just because they're not visible doesn't mean they're not there and not felt in a really tangible way. And here, this image, you can see kind of the bodies falling from the top of the wave of COVID that hit New York in April. And something that's very interesting that I didn't notice at first was if you kind of follow the arrows, and maybe it's kind of hard to see here, that is kind of correlated to the date that it happened. So when I zoom back in on the larger graph, you might note that's around the middle of April that this wave started. And you can follow the arrows and try to match the dates in the timeline, which I find really intriguing. Warner's clever use of page layout and the visual verbal form of the digital foldout, again, it gives readers the ability to consider critically these structures. To start the graph, they merge around this figure of Donald Trump and the number zero and a red dot. The figure of Trump stares directly at the reader viewer and is quoted as saying in March 2020, quote, the coronavirus is very much under control in the USA. Stock market looking, are starting to look very good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Warner's use of form here not only exposes Trump's words as direct falsehoods, we see chaos all around him throughout the whole entire thing, even though he's saying it's all fine. It exposes them as direct falsehoods, and it also encourages reader viewers to think of the former president's inaction as the starting point of the timeline, as the literal ground zero of the coronavirus' subsequent waves of death that move across the rest of the page. Trump's emphatic rhetoric and claims of control are situated in stark contrast to the economic chaos and dead bodies symbolized all around him. While he looks toward the spectator and away from impending tragedy, the reader viewer sees that the republic for which Trump supposedly stands is about to be swept underneath the continuous waves of infection, death, and inequality represented throughout Warner's image. It is no coincidence that the figure of Donald Trump and the red-white coloring associated with him appears frequently where the graphs converge and explode, 
In fact, he is the only person ever depicted looking straight at the reader viewer. The fold-out's positioning of Trump proposes that he is directly responsible for downplaying the pandemic's dangers, and his legacy in the spectator's mind will forever be merged with escalating death and destruction. The reader viewer watches frequently in horror as Trump looks away, a process that mirrors the all-too-familiar experience of American life in 2020. As the reader viewer moves across the timeline of events from March through September 2020, the effects of Trump's looking away are revealed explicitly through statistics, graphs, and visual metaphor. The April and September months of the graph, which are denoted by color patterns alternating between purple-white and green-white, blur together with the centralized red-white imagery that marks Trump's actions and media comments during the pandemic. By repeatedly positioning Trump's quotes and policies at or near the visual center of the calendar graphs, Warner again implicates the former president's continued dithering as a primary catalyst for the disparities intensified by the pandemic. One wonders alongside Warner's text what might have been if Trump spent less time focusing on opening with a bang and more time promoting face masks and social distancing. And I think this also emphasizes the way that whenever Trump spoke about the pandemic, it was such a media frenzy and always very centralized to the narrative. So his presence in the narrative, I think, is really key here. And we can kind of wonder alongside this image what maybe would have been had he not been so focused on the economy and more focused on face masks and vaccines. It's hard to imagine what could have been. The human costs of the Trump administration's inaction are foregrounded most clearly in the July and August portions of the fold-up. Here, and you can kind of see it on the, the far right of July, the average number of infections reaches a breaking point of 65,000 cases per day which causes a rupture in the upper boundaries of Warner's graft. Warner's July panel suggests that no framing system, whether found in data points or in a comment, can truly encapsulate the staggering effects of COVID-19 on American life. The sheer volume of COVID cases in July 2020 is further emphasized by an era pointing upward toward a peak outside the daily infections graph. The number 65,000 is presented in large white font and is surrounded on all sides by Trump's quotes and information about easing of coronavirus restrictions. And I should note that in April, you can also see the arrow at the height of the New York wave pointing upward, just which suggests to me it's much higher than we actually can even register in a graph. A graph can't measure all of the chaos. Both text and image work together in this moment to contradict and displace Trump's narrative. As Trump invokes the Lone Ranger in the concept of masks being a personal choice, reader viewers see that the pandemic has cost 27 million Americans to lose health care. As he screams, it will all work out. We will see that the U.S. death toll has surpassed 100,000 people. As he claims, this thing is going away like things go away, we see in a pie chart that the United States accounts for 20% of all COVID-19 deaths, despite having only 4% of the world's population. We'll return to the larger image here. Warner's sophisticated presentation of information, his layering of Trump's denial, alongside graphs detailing the suffering and disparity experienced by so many during the pandemic, reveals the ways in which COVID-19 has become intricately woven into the very fabric of our lives and deaths. And that's Andy's quote at the end of the graph. It might not be visible here. The form and content of Warner's fold-out emphasizes these complex threads and far-reaching events that bind us together as the pandemic rages onward. For the United States as a whole, there may be a sense in 2021 that the pandemic is fading. For those willing to take a closer look, Warner's fold-out serves as a reminder that death and inequality is still occurring, even if we cannot always see it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so, uh, Deb Samuel is a six-year PhD student wandering the halls of com uh, comic studies cinema studies, and post-colonial literature. You're with a permanently amused, or permanently amazed face. Um, he'd, uh, he'd also like to let you know that someday he wishes to feature in a comic as a half-human, half-owl. Um, <laughs> um, although he's not moderating the panel with me today, uh, Deb worked uh, 
Deb and I worked closely on uh, putting this to on coordinating this panel, and it wouldn't have come together without his efforts. So I would like to thank him um, both for his uh, for sharing both his labor and his camaraderie during this um, difficult term. And um, today he'll be expressing his amazement at Joe Sacco's art and journalism in the pages of Palestine. All right, thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, as my slide says, I'm going to talk about Gaius Confine in Joe Sacco's Palestine, times two. Um, all right, um, Joe Sacco's comics attempts to capture overwhelming realities. The clamor of contradictory voices, the chronicler's own awkward presence, the chaos of conflict. All the noise and clutter of experience fill his comics pages. And yet, as is evident in these pages from Palestine, this clutter is organized by an acute sense of layout and design, a mastery of the mise en page. For example, pages 32 and 33 represent a chaotic space. Right? We discover Sacco's narrator visiting a hospital ward in Nablus, a city on the northern west bank. The foreign journalist is rushed from one bed to another by his guide and a crowd of anxious relatives who ask him to bear witness to the pain and suffering of the patients, all victims in the ongoing conflict. Sacco's overall mise en page across these two pages convey desperation and anxiety. The panels are asymmetrical trapezoids of various sizes scattered on the page at askewed angles. The grid-like structure of a more traditional page can still be glimpsed, but only beneath the surface, as a kind of ghostly palimpsest. Captions of texts are placed directly over the images, rather than in corners, above or to the side of the action. The words seem to interpose themselves between the viewer and the depicted action almost violently. Hand -lettered the font style and letter size vary from caption to caption, even as the captions themselves tumble widely across and down the pages, giving the entire scene a precarious, urgent quality. Within the panels, Sacco maintains mid-range perspective on his subjects while varying his camera angles from frame to frame keeping everything in motion, even though the main subjects of the scene, a group of men and women in the hospital ward, are relatively static. Sacco's characteristic drawing style, which is reminiscent of underground cartoonist Robert Crumb's style, amplifies raw emotions through caricatures. So, the central image on page 32 Free of panel boundaries presents the patient in bed number three as if through a fisheye lens. His face appears slightly magnified and disproportionately oblong. Deep, clear lines of agony mark his squint and are accentuated by beads of sweat. His clenched jaw dominates the portrait, exaggerated in its width, each tooth individually delineated in a grimace of pain. Similarly, in the final panel on the next page, Sacco poignantly conveys both the suffering of an injured girl shot down in her own schoolyard and her childlike delight at being photographed. Our eyes are pulled around the pages by the layout and our emotional responses are similarly manipulated by the complex mix of raw human emotions. We feel both the resentment from patients and their families towards the presence of an outsider etched onto their disgruntled faces, but also their conflicted desire that this suffering 
should be documented, should be witnessed. Amidst all of this, Sacco's narrator appears diminutive and overwhelmed, yet maintains his commitment to the task of witnessing. A different kind of clutter and chaos finds expression in the more traditional mise en page in, the sequence from, in this sequence from Palestine titled Moderate Pressure, Part 2. Uh, the pages are 112, 102 to 113 in the original graphic novel. The sequence tells Ghazan's story, beginning as he's arrested in his middle class living room in East Jerusalem. That's a direct quote. By the Israeli police and army on suspicions of links to an quote unquote illegal organization. As the narrative of incarceration, torture, and systemic oppression unfolds, Sacco utilizes a tight grid, a tight grid like page design to convey the effect of the walls literally closing in on Kazan. The panels shrink in size and increase in numbers as the narrative progresses from house to car, car to police station, to court, and back to jail again and again and again. We shift from 6 to 9 to 12 to 16, and then three 20 paneled waffle iron grids. Meanwhile, the images themselves repeat hammering the reader with the terrible routine of Ghazan's incarceration. The dreadful repeatedness of this torture is conveyed not merely through a series of near identical images, but also through the steadily shrinking confines of each panel. The basic semiotic units of the page thus becomes symbolic of the confines of his cell. And this becomes, if we, if we go through this quickly, you'll realize how this is very clearly visible as we move through the pages, as we see that the confines are getting closer and closer, quite visibly and perceptibly. It's palpable how the confines, how the, how the walls are closing in on Ghazan as we move through the pages. Finally, when Ghazan's release comes. It's unexpected and sudden. He needs time to even believe the idea that he is free and can return home. And so, after three pages dominated by 20 tiny panels, Sacco moves to the relative openness of a seven panel grid. Ghazan walks through three smaller silent panels depicting the outside world, before Sacco's camera eye pulls back to give us a page-wide street scene in the last panel of the sequence. The effect is as if Ghassan took a moment to squint and adjust before perceiving the full picture of the world and its plan. And then as if he lost, he got lost or got absorbed again in the clamor of narratives, in the clamor of lost narratives, that is Palestine. The rigid, deliberately repetitive layout of Ghazan's narrative stands in stark contrast to the loose, scattershot effect of the pages in the hospital in Nablus. But both vividly convey the experience of human suffering against a background of systemic failure. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so Ryan Davies is a second year PhD, uh, English PhD student whose research areas include comic studies, media studies, and psychology. Uh, they will be discussing Dan Archer's challenges to human objectivity and the blurring of the real and the virtual in Ferguson firsthand. <laughs> 
I just want to start by saying a lot of people have been asking me about the all purple fashion line that Dr. Saunders and I have been working on. <laughs> um, I, if you could just hold your questions, it's um, it's a pandemic. You know, we're doing the best we can. Um, so, Ferguson first. None of us will ever really know what happened in Ferguson, Missouri, in the early afternoon of August 9th, 2014, the day that Officer Darren Wilson shot Michael Brown to death. Dan Archer's Ferguson First Hand doesn't attempt to offer a definitive account of this distressing event, but instead it employs the technology of virtual reality to remind us just how tenuous our grasp on reality can truly be. That is, how hard it is to distinguish supposedly neutral acts of observation from the subjective processes of interpretation and reconstruction that happen in our minds. Archer's piece deftly reproduces the scene of the crime and its aftermath within the bounds of a virtual reproduction of the stretch of Canfield Drive where Brown was killed. Within these narrow geographic confines, Archer blurs the boundaries between the real and the virtual emphasizing the unreliability of our faculties of perception and recollection, so that those faculties come to seem every bit as virtual as the representational medium of the artwork itself. And actually, the medium itself is pretty important here. If you haven't tried VR since it started to take off again around 2014, it's hard to explain just how impressive the medium has become. First of all, you have to know that the, the pictures I'm going to show you here are not going to do it justice. You should really go try it if you haven't, and you can actually do so in the Art of the News exhibit here. Um, so to give you a picture uh, of, of kind of what VR can do, uh, this last week I was uh, playing a VR game called Bogo that had me physically leaning down to pet a cute little creature feeding it apples and throwing a stick for it to fetch. And you can imagine how ridiculous this looks to an outside observer. I've got giant goggles on my head and I'm going like, hey little guy, you know, um, <laughs> it's, it's kind of silly. Um, but that's the effect that VR has on you when you're in it. You really feel like you're in that world. It's an effect that Stanford VR guru Jeremy Balenson calls psychological presence where what is for many of us the primary sense of perception, sight, is so deeply engaged that our brains actually believe we've been transported to a new realm. So when somebody fires a gun at you in VR and you don't get out of the way of the bullet in time, you flinch as though you've really been shot. And rationally, you can tell yourself that what you're seeing isn't real, but your brain isn't buying it. It's just another way that perception fails us. What this means for Ferguson firsthand is that while you've got the headset on, as far as your brain is concerned, you're on that stretch of road where Brown died. It isn't like you're watching a news report or anything like that. You're there on the street. You can probably imagine that this is pretty affecting. So as you explore this space that Archer presents, you can stop at designated beacons of various colors. Black beacons, for instance, denote the approximate locations from which witnesses experience the incident and also allows users to listen to audio playback of their testimony at Darren Wilson's grand jury trial. Listening to these accounts, it quickly becomes apparent that there is no one version of what occurred that day. Instead, according to various witnesses, Brown had stopped with his hands up, or he was running away, or he was on his knees, or he was charging at Officer Wilson. Such discrepancies between eyewitness accounts are hardly uncommon. Witness testimony is notoriously unreliable despite the primacy U.S. and European cultures often place on personal experience of an incident. In fact, this phenomenon is so common that it has a name, the Rashomon Effect, a reference to the Kurosawa film of the same name in which four witnesses each describe a murder in contradictory ways. But even this doesn't fully capture just how unreliable our memories can be. I'm going to tell you something now that if you didn't know before, you're going to have trouble not thinking about for a long time. Um, so please don't find me and beat me up after the panel. Um, there have been multiple studies over the past 10 years or, sh or so that show that because of the ways that our neural pathways are constantly changing, the more that we call up a memory in our minds, the more distorted it becomes. So the first time we remember something, we might be recalling something reasonably close to the actual event, although still colored by our interpretations. 
But then the next time that we return to that memory, we're only really remembering the last time that we remembered. And the time after that, we're recalling that second recreation of the memory, and so on and so on, with each new remembrance further distorting the details. In effect, then, our most cherished memories are the most likely to be the least accurate. So the more we remember a once-in-a-lifetime experience, something we'll never be able to do again, or reminisce about a lost loved one, the more our brains muddle those moments and introduce inaccuracies. And so also, as you can imagine, eyewitnesses who are asked to repeatedly recall the details of what happened at a particular moment in time by police at the scene, by friends and family, by lawyers at depositions, later at court, are losing a little bit of the real every time that they call that memory back up. Kind of scary to think about. So it makes sense that these audio clips are accompanied by visualizations of Brown acting in accordance with the various witness testimonies, but that instead of being smoothly animated, Brown is represented by blurred static images that also give users a sense of the physical distance each individual witness would have been from the events of the shooting as they occurred. While the statements themselves quickly reveal just how flawed our memories and perceptions can be, this juxtaposition of conflicting recollections with fractured visual reproductions of the incident further unsettles any notions of such a thing as human objectivity. It is significant, too, that Brown is the person who is most often graphically represented in these moments. Officer Darren Wilson often remains obscured inside of his car or too far away to see clearly, which serves both to keep the focus on the victim of the shooting and to encourage users to envision for themselves how Wilson fits into the scene presented to them. Do we imagine him as a monster, murderously abusing his authority or as a public servant in a difficult situation? Do we see him as angry and even vengeful or as threatened and frightened? And do we take the word of the man who says that Brown was charging at the officer, or the woman who says that Wilson stood over a kneeling Brown and, quote, emptied his clip. Might we even begin to imagine other scenarios apart from these extremes? And as our imaginations are engaged by speculating about the events of that day, we're reminded that the firsthand eyewitnesses of the scene were also always already interpreting the scene, even as it unfolded before them. Two other types of beacons in Ferguson First Hand work to exacerbate this confusion of the real and the virtual. The colored beacons in the simulation present Archer's comic strip recreations of the witness testimonies broadcast by the media immediately after the shooting occurred. The recessive nesting of representational elements here is striking. At the first level, we have the eyewitness testimony of the incident. At the next level, we have the media's reproduction of that witness's testimony, which itself has been edited for national consumption. At another level, we have representations of those representations by Archer himself in comics form. And finally, those representations are themselves represented within a virtual reality recreation of the scene of the crime. Thus, the acts of communication, witnessing, and reportage become different nodes of exchange in a giant game of telephone where the primary event is displaced and dispersed across multiple forms of media in an astounding array of subject positions. No less jarring are the piece's white beacons, which present users with crime scene photos of Canfield Drive from forensic investigators. Even as these images forcefully remind the viewer that this virtual artwork reflects upon an all too real and traumatic loss of human life that occurred, we are once again thrown into a position in which the virtual and real are enmeshed in alarming ways. As users step into the white beacons, they're presented with photographs, so two-dimensional static images that attempt to represent an ever-changing three-dimensional reality inside of a three-dimensional virtual space within which they must physically interact. Or to put it in terms that better illuminate the utter weirdness of this effect, the user is given the opportunity to look at an inadequate representation of reality from inside of another inadequate representation of reality by physically acting within and upon the latter inadequate representation by means of a piece of real world technological hardware. It's a lot to take in. When we've seen enough of Ferguson firsthand, we can take off the VR headset and return from virtual reality to whatever this is. But the experience may leave you reflecting on just how real 
our reality is and just how reliable your memories of it will ever be. How accurate will your own recall of Archer's piece be 10 minutes later, 10 days later? What about 10 months? What memories do you feel certain of that now might need to be re-examined? And will your re-examination of those memories only muddle them even further? Of course, there's one aspect of the events that occurred on Canfield Drive that day that's not a matter of interpretation. Michael Brown, a black man at the very beginning of his adult life, was shot to death. I hope we can agree that's a tragedy. And of the many lessons Ferguson firsthand imparts, I hope that is the one that everyone who views it will not forget. Brian, and thank you to all of the uh, presenters. Um, I, so I'd like to um, begin this Q&A um, with, with a, a question for the panel. Um, so uh, before opening this up, um, so last night at, at um, the um, Joe Sacco panel, um, near the end of it, uh, Deb, uh, describe the almost separate worlds of comics creation and comics scholarship. And um, since then, I've been thinking about these two different modes, and but but perhaps not in the way that he was thinking uh, that that Deb, uh, was meant them. And um, so we we as aspiring uh, scholars. Um, read and analyze comics, but we also put years of our lives into what I can only understand as um, creative responses to them. So in this symposium, um, foregrounding creative processes, um, what drives you to write on comics? <laughs> like a, a sort of sister form of media 
because they were both windows into this other world um, and these spaces where I could kind of, um, as a kid with really severe asthma, like, you know, peer into these places that might hold possibilities for me that it felt like the real world sometimes didn't. Um, so I think that that was kind of the start of it. And my start was from reading superhero comics as a really young person ever. Uh, my oldest brother collected Marvel from like the 1970s. So I remember being like five years old reading things I shouldn't have been reading, like The Punisher blowing up Peter Parker in like a hospital or something. And I don't know, it was just kind of my first love of reading was in comics and thinking about, kind of to echo what Alex was saying, how image and text are working in conjunction is really complicated. And I think getting to think about how those things are creating meaning is really fruitful for me as kind of a selfish reason. And that's kind of why I'm, I'm drawn to them. There's something about the medium that's very complicated and I just, I love it. And we can kind of see in all the presentations all the different aspects that go into these creations. It's, it's amazing. So I don't know, I love it. Apple and apples are long into that side. <laughs> <laughs> Um, also, uh, I was struck, Ryan, by your, your description of the, the inadequacy of um, memory that, that um, when I had read through your piece, I, I, hearing you speak on it changed something in that for me. And um, personally, it, it reminded me of part of what I, I found fascinating about comics, which is the, the sort of you know, acknowledged inadequacy of representing reality. And I was just wondering, um, again, sort of considering the comics as a form, um, how you consider that mediation um, of reality in this, in this medium versus the, the other work you, the other forms you've studied. Yeah, I mean, again, I think there are a lot of similarities um, between things like, you know, video games and, and comics. And um, for me, that that mediation was always like a part of my enjoyment, not, not necessarily thinking about memory, but just these sort of levels of representation because I was always sort of, um, wistful about like sort of placing myself in these realities and and they always seemed more real to me in, in a lot of ways than the world that I was living in every day um, where I was sort of stuck in bed half the time with pneumonia and, and so like um, that for me I mean like there are definitely times for me where, where it feels like the sort of barriers dissolve and, and, and I'm, I'm more there than I am here, you know? Um, and so I'm always thinking about consciousness and like presence and, and these ways that we um, are able to sort of like inhabit these spaces that are representations, but, but maybe sometimes feel like a lot more than that. And, and that's sort of the magic um, the fact that, that we are able to sort of live in those worlds and, and, and that the boundaries are maybe less um, explicit and, and less meaningful than we make them out to be. Yeah. Um, that, that was it, if anyone else wanted <laughs> I, I have some other possible questions, but I'd like to, to open it up to the room if anyone would like to ask the panel something. A lot of the choices 
So um, in one of the courses that I took uh, that Charles Hatfield did, um, and he was a um, big name for those of you maybe not um, in the comics academic realm, um, he made us as the final project create a comic, and we were all very like, oh no, that's not, we don't draw. He's like, no, that's not really the point of this. Um, it would be great if you could draw, but that's not, that's not what we're doing here. Um, and so the process of trying to put a story across, um, the how to break things down and how to think about layout were so valuable for everything I did moving forward that I still think about the very awkward comic that I made that one time. So I do think that um, it would be great if we did, but I type I do not. So. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, yes, yeah. Um, I don't make comics, but I make a lot of visual poetry, especially blackout poetry. So a lot of thinking about like the flow of the thing, and like I'm gonna pick the word here instead of here because it'll make it look nicer on the page, and then fill it in with like different color blocking and stuff to make it look aesthetically pleasing. We had the opportunity, and Dr. Kelp said, as his class to make a comic. Um, as opposed to writing a seminar paper, and I jumped at it even though I can't draw. Um, it's always been an insecurity I've had since I was really little. I did terrible in art. But when I sat down to kind of make it, kind of echo what they were both saying, it was really intriguing thinking about all the little choices that go into creating meaning. So there's narrative elements, there's page design and placement, there's where do all these things go, how do I construct this, and it was really, really difficult. Um, I'm a notorious procrastinator, and it took me three weeks to do five pages. I just couldn't decide, and then if I messed up, I was hand drawing, I had to go back and do it again. So that really got me to think a lot more about the process that went into it, and kind of the intricacies of that. And it made me greatly informed by reading when it came time to kind of think about what might have went into the creation of the text I analyzed today. Um, so I have done a little bit of cartooning and caricatures for uh, a couple of newspapers back in India, and I used to, uh, and there was a time that I used to work uh, like a lot on drawing uh, cartoons and then, but after a point of time, I kind of realized that, and and this was a kind of uh, you know also breed that was given to us when we were drawing this that you you have to present it within this much amount of time and you have to uh, send it within this. So after a point of time, I kind of thought that I was uh, falling into this uh, a style approach that, that is there in the Indian newspapers about political cartoons and political ca caricatures. And I kind of wanted to break out of that. And I kind of, want, kind of wanted to think more about it. And that's when the application for PhD and uh, getting into the university kind of happened. Um, so, I'm enjoying the fact that I am getting to know more about the nuances of drawing comics and, uh, and also, of course, learning from all of your work and uh, listening to all of you in this entire uh, seminar, the symposium, exhibition has been awesome and thinking about that. But I would echo uh, Chris here too that I have now become really like a, this, this I procrastinate so much. I, I, I think so much about drawing those things now, which I used to just like, okay, done. And uh, in five minutes, you have to give me five cartoons, my editor said, and I'm giving him four or something like that. And it looks horrible but, uh, to me now. But um, now I think more of them, and I, I'm spending more, more time. And I haven't drawn a single page of comics in this five years, just because I'm thinking so much about it and just, yeah. Yeah, no, I, that's actually really relatable to me. Uh, I am in the, the very early processes of um, trying to make a video game. Um, and that sort of paralysis that creeps in when you study something this much uh, it is is real. Like, uh, I. I feel like, you know, I, I, I used to fire off these video game ideas left and right like it was no big deal, and now that I'm actually sitting down and trying to go, okay, how do I do this? How do I actually make a game? I, I, I feel like I don't know where to begin, and, and wherever I begin is gonna be 
wrong somehow. So uh, yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I think because as you study, you know, at any given medium, you sort of see the best of, of what's out there, and, and so you know, um, it becomes sort of onerous to, to think about trying to like enter this this field with so many talented people. So like how could what what I have to offer really be that meaningful, you know? Um, but um, you know, I, I do believe that that you know that there's something that I can say that is is meaningful. And so um, see how it goes. So maybe like the, uh, the takeaway here is that if you want to study comics, you should definitely try and make them. But if you want to do comics, maybe you should like. I'm sorry, I just wanted to thank you for that question. The first question you, you uh, gave to the panel uh, was really humanizing, I thought. It's really good to see academics sort of why they got interested in comics in the first place, because you can feel a little there's a, a gulf in a certain sense. And I don't know, I don't want to speak to everyone here, but drawing is such like, it's like walking. Uh, if you, you don't want to think about walking. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, it can be debilitating to think. Obviously you've got, there are reasons you're doing things, but they're so, uh, they're just being, you're pulling them out of your head and just coming together on the page. Not, if you think about it too much, it can be the debilitating. So I'm curious what, how you responded to or how much you used Scott McCloud's book, <laughs> Understanding Comics. Um, I, I'd actually like to speak to, to that. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I came to comic studies a, as an illustrator. I had actually been hoping to brush up on my technical abilities, and I, I felt like I had reached my limit without going back to school, basically. And encountering Scott McCloud's work after having practiced for years, and then working with other um, formal theory, um, a lot of what actually drove me from that, that sort of dabbling into now graduate school is my resistance to it. Um, that, that a lot of it was, as you're describing um, comics being like walking, um, I, I felt like a lot of the formalists were, were describing walking in a way that I didn't understand and that, that, that seemed counterintuitive to how I walked to, yeah. to continue that metaphor. And so, um, yeah, that that's how I felt about it. Well, I mean, he's just so useful for teaching comics. And so I think that uh, until we get something else that is done in the medium about the medium, I don't think it can be replaced. Um, and, th and there's still like things that I think hold up really well. Um, and I think that the things that we might um, disagree with um, always produce interesting conversations. So I don't think um, it's good, like it's it's good. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> like going off of that, it's really fun to like have students read it and then watch them like expand upon it in areas that they don't think that it quite covers. So that's another thing that's really useful is that it helps students like get on the right track and start thinking about things more like um, in one of the earlier batches of papers this time my students turned in a lot of stuff where they're like I want to come up with new like types of panel transitions or like I want to like talk about what inset panels are doing a little bit more than he does and it's great and it helps them produce really good work. Yeah and just to add a little bit to that too uh, I had uh, students in my class who had this uh, interesting that um, responses to uh, Scott McCloud saying that, oh, but this is not, I draw a little bit of comics and I do, I'm trying to draw a little bit of comics, but this is not how I think about comics. And so that that gives a really interesting space in the classroom to just then ask, all right, so then how would you then characterize this aspect of comics uh, or, or drawing comics or reading comics or understanding comics uh, other than, and that I think going back to both uh, Alex and Ash's um, ideas there that, 
that gives gives us the space of conversation then expanding on the book and I think which is why it's still yeah I have disagreements but uh, it's still such a good place to start in the class as well. Hi, uh, thank you so very much for these fantastic presentations. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting, this might have been a coincidence, but I thought it was kind of interesting that the presentation ended with something about memory distortion um, in the age of, you know, or the way we consume and you know, distribute information, um, that it could completely undermine the kind of things that uh, we want to, you know, see in journalism, and um, because journalism is not just about, you know, memory distortion, but it's about memory creating, right, for the reader viewer. So, um, in this age of mistrust and distrust in journalism that we live in, do you feel that there's something that the comics journalism provides that is different? from the other kind of journalism, and as you see that comic journalism is something that can restore faith in journalism. I mean, I think the thing that comes to mind for me immediately is that um, it's sort of um, immediately throws out this, this thing about objectivity and says, I'm going to put some interpretation on this, and it makes that interpretation like immediately apparent and, and so there's um, to me that's really compelling that because you know that that is something that's frustrating to me is this this thought that somehow anybody can really be completely objective when, when reporting on something and so with, with comics you know I mean it, it does feel like something about the medium itself says I'm going to be subjective about this and that's part of it that's okay, and so I, I, I personally, yeah, that, that's being Well, I think it gets to what I really like of why I'm a formalist that does this, and the thing that underlines kind of like all of formalism is that like, it's this way, but it could have been otherwise. And it, everything is a kind of like a choice by the creator, but so much of the kind of like text or photography seems to have like arrived before that almost. And there's something about the kind of like the hand that creates the drawing that um, underlines, as you're kind of like saying, this subjectivity, but in a way that is really um, like, that's the point. That's the thing that, we, that we're into, so. question that seems better opposed to you is uh, merging, well, as comic scholars you're publishing, um, and that is, uh, we barely talked so far, people barely talked about, uh, about notions of graphic novels and where they fit in, and I'm, so I'm curious how you see, say, the relationship between comics journalism, what we might think of as uh, graphic novels that are more fiction, do they belong more with you know, Marvel and DC? Do they belong more with notions of literature on the page? Is comic journalism is it closer to George Orwell to you know, someone that I think Joe mentioned? Um, how do you see, how do each of you see the, um, the affinities there? And this isn't just about taxonomies. I think it's more about what the what the work is really wanting to be in some um, in some more more sort of deep deep way in terms of what is what is scientist's job and what, is, um, what kind of meaning it's arguing for and trying to make and how how the you know the artists can make it the way how they're trying to kind of talk to the world and how they want to be part of it. Well, I mean, I think of comics not as a genre, which is kind of what that's getting at, um, or even a kind of like 
publication um, audience um, and more of a medium. And so in the same way that like um, film uh, can span multiple, it can be a documentary or it can be a Marvel movie, comics can do all sorts of these things. And it is the art of kind of like combining text and, um, well, I don't, Let's not do the definition thing. No, I don't think like I'm going to do that for here. Um, but uh, I think it's interesting that a lot of the things that we did for the collection were originally like published, if not, you know, either kind of like collected or, um, as you say, a graphic novel for some of the more specific ones came like. We saw them first through the internet. I'm someone that gets like the nib to my email, and so like the way that I interact with that is very different than you know buying a uh, new book, as it kind of like already comes to me in graphic novel format. So I think I think it's an interesting question for like where comics journalism might fall audience wise, depending on how we're how we're encountering it. Um, but I, I'm, like I said, I, the terminology might be throwing me off for this question a bit. Yeah, it's not so much about the terminology. It's almost more like um, you've got a room and you've got Art Spiegelman in it and you might have you know Joe Sacco in it, but you might not have Jack Kirby in it because he's in a different room. It, it's more, so I'm curious as to what, who's in the room if there's comics journalists in it too, and are the graphic novelists in the room? Or are they in a room with someone else? Uh, yeah. There is a taxonomy there, I'll admit. But it's more about, I think it was more of an affinity than a sort of formal taxonomy or a notion of image, text, et cetera. Because if you look at image text, you could have photographers, you could have mm -hmm. Lorna Simpson or Carrie Mae Weems in there too. But we don't tend to talk about them when we talk about comics. I have a, I don't know if, if this will be a direct answer to that question or not, but uh, I have, uh, I can uh, offer an interesting observation that I have from the South Asian uh, market and its treatment of comic books, graphic novels, and comic journalism, in the sense, and it's a little unfortunate too, that how uh, texts of comic journalism are kind of treated in, because they are usually clubbed with that within that uh, uh, term of graphic novelist or put in that uh, room, so to, to take that metaphor a little bit, um, it kind of has developed a little bit of a class connotation to it. Uh, in, in the sense that a common reader of comic books will gravitate more towards the thinner comic books uh, uh, in Marvel, uh, and of course, Marvel, DC, and Indian. Uh, comic book public, uh, publisher. And there are graphic novelists, there are comic journalists in India as well who are working on, uh, but when they are producing these works, they are kind of seen as the elite, educated upper class who does not speak to the common person's problems. Which is, I think, a little bit unfortunate because uh, there are graphic journalists uh, comic journalists and graphic novelists and uh, uh, comic cartoon artists who are trying to piece those problems together, trying to get into those, uh, uh, you know, get onto the streets, trying to uh, portray some of the problems, daily problems. But because they are sold in a certain bookshop or in certain markets or at a certain price by certain publica publications and publishers, they develop a very heavy class connotation to that and, uh, and are limited in their audiences. I don't know if that kind of uh, response, uh, a response to your question or not, but uh, I thought it, was, it would be an interesting kind of observation to put in this context about the South Asian market. Yeah, thank you. Well, can I say just one more thing? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it seems to me that there's also a problem of like, how much there is to something, because if you're trying to put like Palestine, which is a thicker book, it seems to work next to something like Bechdel or something like that, whereas you have like Warner's like amazing formal like graph, and that is comics journalism, and that is like 
or something like that. And so, once again, like there's a, I think the, the audience question and like, for comics journalism, the long form uh, book type thing that is trying to get really deep on a particular subject is one thing and the kind of like slightly more immediate and can get out to a wider audience and it's trying to basically get as many eyes as possible and use the visual which people are better at these days um, reading a kind of like image almost instinctively rather than reading a kind of like wall of text and so there's an accessibility component to what comics journalism can do as well. I'd, I'd like to ask you, any of you that would like to respond, to, to reflect on a cultural shift that you are all witnessing and participating in as this museum is, as Kate Phelps Evans and Ben Saunders are, which is a process of cultural legitimation mm -hmm. and rising cultural capital of comics. Dave just spoke about the comic book. I mean, when I used to buy Marvel Comics, you know, I'd go to the corner store and pay 25 cents and it would be on this flimsy, crappy paper. I certainly wouldn't go into Barnes and Noble and see shelves of peanuts in beautifully down centigraphic <laughs> volume. And when I was where you are, the idea that any of us would be writing papers and presenting at conferences on comics, that was laughable. I couldn't even suggest such a thing to any prof that I've had much less being in, a, in a, an institution that hires a tenured faculty member in the field of comic studies in an academic museum where this is the, then the fourth, the fifth show of comics that has been influenced in the yeah. art show. What is it, what, how do you feel about this process that you are participating in of bringing comics into these institutions of cultural centrality and legitimacy and power. Uh, and you know, I, I'm thinking of Jared Gardner talking about the, you know, the art of the gutter. And there's a kind of value in being in the gutter. There's something positive about being on the outs. But we're, we're not at that place anymore. We're, we're past that place. It was sort of like Joe was saying last night when he first started trying to persuade venues for journalism to feature this work. They, there's no way that that would have happened. So how do you feel about this? Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Uh, are, you, are you happy to be participating in it? Are you, any thoughts at all? Um, I would like to say here that it, it, it reminds me, and as, as being a part of this as, as, a, as a comic study scholar, as somebody who's in the and everything, also, somebody who has traveled from their home country to an international institution and working on it, the idea of just like acad I don't know if I can use that word, but account academizing comic books and, and, and is also sort of creating unintentionally perhaps, but creating a divide in the kind of which comic books are to be read by the people and which comic books are the academy. In, in, in a very similar way that how, can, how we look at pulp, uh, the popular pulp uh, publications, like for instance, the Hindi pulp is a, is a, it's a burgeoning market back in India. It's, it's, it's so vibrant, if you look into it, it's, it's just colorful, it's crazy, and, uh, it sells like hundreds and thousands of copies um, in a day, but they are so cheap, and they, they, you, you, they're so cheap in terms of the, uh, the, the, the paper quality, the price, and everything. And, but it's very confined to a certain section and certain region of the country, which it's being read in, right? Now, whereas, on the other hand, if you go to metropolitan cities like Delhi, uh, Mumbai, Kolkata, you, you are invariably now moving away from Nabraj, uh, Raj Comics, uh, all the comic books which are associated with the quiche, the, uh, the, the Hindi public, uh, the PAL publications. And now you're moving towards uh, Sana Banerjee, Orijit Sen, uh, Vishwajyoti Ghosh, who are giving you these. Uh, so there is, I don't know if this is intentional or unintentional, but this is 
this is definitely propagated also by the fact that I have met in the last about one year or so, so many Indian scholars who are trying to come to United States uh, universities trying to read comic studies. And if you look at their uh, scholarships, they're all looking at the graphic novels, the, the comic journalism. And none of them are kind of thinking about almost like 60 years, 70 years of history of Indian comic books before that. So I think there's a, the, it is kind of creating a divide, and we are participating in it intentionally or unintentionally, but I cannot say whether this is good or bad. Is there, is there now a scope to now pull those, the pulp aspect of comic books back into academia, think about it, read the, write papers about those, and etc. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's sort of interesting because I wonder, I always wonder like um, how the academy ends up influencing what is going to be produced in the future. For example, I feel like there's, there has been, you know, perhaps for good reason, uh, resistance to the, a, a history of comics like the underground comics in America because now they're problematic for students. Mm -hmm. So how do you work with that? Because this is, it's central to a lot of what uh, people from my generation uh, imbibed and how we produce our own work. But the academy is sort of filtering things out because perhaps it's problematic to teach things that have imagery that's unacceptable now. I mean, how do you deal with that? Well, it reminds me of um, uh, Professor Saunders, not to call you out, has been talking <laughs> about like what it would look like to teach like uh, a graduate level seminar on R. Crumb for like years now. I remember him telling you about that, like whenever I was second year or something like that, and just like the what you would have to do to take that on, even in a graduate seminar, is um, daunting to think about um, from both like a, like the professor teaching it and as a student in that classroom, like how do you come to these things? And so I think that um, point well taken about what what can be canonized, which is already a problem. But I also think that one of the things that has been really good about the movement towards having comics in the uh, academy is that things that were not being saved are now we're going back and like trying to save them. Like so many of like the comic strips that were never like republished or um, were only on like microfilm. Like I mean they're now being, as you said, like uh, or I think someone else mentioned in beautiful copies um, by Fanta Graphics. And so suddenly things that were not being preserved Students can see them, um, and that's that's really cool. So I do I think that there's as with anything some pros and cons. So yeah, thank you again for your your work. It's really good. Well, well, um, <laughs> Uh, I guess my uh, frame is both like inward and outward. So it, inwardly, how do you find you are treated by the academy in terms of within the communications field? Is it very much like a hermeneutics approach where they don't like to contextualize you and you're your own silo? And then outwardly, internationally, if you've seen, because you know, the French, for example, have got quite a detail. And there's the language of comics and a whole range of other semantics. So I'm wondering how that stands up. Because obviously there's kind of an angle of um, focus here. Um, yeah. I've been way too chatty. I've seen lots of things. Yeah. Uh -huh. But but I think I think I'll have to uh, kind of uh, address the international part a little bit here. Uh, I think my experience with it is yes, it has. It has become, especially as we move from uh, move across universities, across international spaces, bring our research from, let's say, uh, I met someone. Uh, I, I talked to someone who's. Uh, I was been talking to someone who was who's thinking of coming to U Oregon or uh, University of Florida or something, 
and thinking about Argentina and uh, and working on comics in Argentina and everything and uh, the kind of and then of course in South Asia, Southeast Asia as well. The idea is that there are so far the, the kind of work that I've seen is one is looking at translations, looking at translate translating these indigenously produced works for the global audience. Uh, the other kind of uh, research that is also happening is on, of course, the, the, the comic books that are written in English in India or in it. Uh, but so far, which that, that basically means, and this, this is just my experience, my experience can be very limited and everything, of course, in this case, but so far it looks to me that it is very Anglophone heavy, Anglophone oriented, and uh, it is, it is kind of focused towards the idea of the English-speaking world, whether that English-speaking world is in the West or in South Asia or in, other, in the global South, kind of recognizing that there are other art forms indigenously produced and then kind of giving voice to that by anglicizing those, uh, those art forms. So that kind of, I think, is happening, and I think it's happening more from where I come, from the cultural milieu that I study in my research, which is the South Asian cultural milieu, and of course there can, uh, there can be differences in Latin America, in, in uh, Middle East, in, in Europe, all of that. But yeah, from in South Asia there is definitely, and of course we have the colonial hangover, uh, which which gets nicely coded in to all of this. Um. Questions. We will be taking a break until 2 p.m. when we will return with a roundtable from Tracy, um, Jesus, Joe, and Andy. So please do come back at 2 for that. But in the meantime, I hope that we continue these conversations into the break. And thank you again.